All right, I'd like to welcome everybody back to uh, the Real Estate Playbook. This is episode four. Super excited today that I not only have somebody that I highly respect out in the uh, real estate industry, but also a close personal friend, uh, Mike Knapp. Mike, how are you doing today? Hey, Joe, what's going on, man? How are we doing? A real Estate Playbook. Yeah, yeah, doing well, doing well, man. It's been uh, way too long. Definitely, definitely. Can't wait to get to see you in person very, very soon. Yeah, absolutely. It's like... Uh, we live in two different worlds out there now, huh? Me in Florida, you in New York. Yeah, yeah. Gotta get out, <laughs> get down there. Gotta get down there. Absolutely. So, Mike, I know currently, um, obviously, Remax broker owner. Why don't you tell us, you know, how many franchises are you up to now? Uh, so, I got four offices currently. Wow. In uh, yep, Brooklyn, Staten Island, New York. Awesome, man. And how many agents? Uh, about 125. That's incredible. And when did you start the, the brokerage journey? Uh, I started about four years ago. So 125 agents in four years and four offices now. Yes, sir. That's awesome, man. Well, congrats, dude. That's incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So why did, so now obviously we know kind of what the end looks like or not the end, obviously, but where you're currently at. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your journey? Like what did it take for you to get up to where you are now? Yes. I mean, I've been doing this now 20 years. Uh, when I got started, I worked for a small mom and pop. And that's really where it, where it kind of got the, the roots. Uh, I had a mentor there. He's currently uh, in the business for over 45 years. He actually uh, joined the firm. So it was really kind of bittersweet to be alongside him today uh, again. And uh, yeah, when I first got started, you know, I wasn't even wanting to be in the real estate business. I was uh, in college. I had a lot of side hustles. I did uh, nightclub promotions. In fact, that's where um, I kind of met my mentor, not at a nightclub, but I kind of uh, got my roots through there. I got my through a friend of mine who needed some help to book a party. Uh, that's how I met. That's how I met him uh, for one of his one of, one of his, his uh, kids. So, um, so that's how I met. It's just a very interesting story. But the, the truth of the matter is, that I didn't want to stay in it. In fact, my mother really didn't uh, want me to be in it because it wasn't a stable job, right? You know, yeah. stable. Get a get a job <laughs> back, get, you know, with the city. You know, either do something with your life to the moon or get a job with the city. Yeah. Um, and I was glad, though, that they persisted uh, recruiting me as an assistant, uh, because obviously it really changed, uh, changed a lot of my trajectory in my life. Absolutely. So uh, working there for seven years, I, uh, as I said, I still didn't want to be in real estate. I wanted to be an attorney. I finished my college degree. Uh, and then I realized I don't want to be an attorney. I realized I said, wow, I really enjoy the real estate business and I want to take it to the to the next next level. Um, you know, it was tough, honestly, to, to leave that, that brokerage to, because I just felt like I wanted to, to just bust out of the seams. It was really, it was basically just a few handful of agents there. Yeah. So I did Remax as an individual agent. And, um, you know, it's interesting, Joe, what was interesting when I joined Remax, I actually thought I was a, a top producer already. And when I got there, I realized I was just a small fish. And I walked in, I was like, uh... Yeah, I remember when they had the award ceremony that year. Uh, it was a very short year too because I joined late in the year. Uh, I thought I was I even. I thought I was actually going to be winning an award. Um, little did I know that uh, there's so many other people that were really, really just uh, blowing the doors off. So oh, absolutely. So, so through that first award ceremony, though, that's that's why I wanted to share that quick story. Is that I, I was like, wait a minute. I have got to master this craft even more than I've ever did before. So uh, really what I would say is that through that process, I became uh, a lifelong student, you know, right. and literally just started unpacking and, and be able to meet people like you and other people around the nation, really just get to get, I really learn the business, honestly. So uh, through my years of Remax as an individual though, uh, I started studying other people and I realized, okay, well, if I want to take my business to the next life level, um, I needed an assistant, so I hired an assistant after years. By the way, I'm short, and we don't have enough time, Joe, if you're on my journey, but I will tell you, though, once I hired an assistant, though, that's kind of where they changed. Uh, the first assistant I hired, like but then What's that? Like where the light went on, where everything started to click, and you started Yeah, to because, you know, I was stuck, and, and it's a nice place to be, so Remax is called the Chairman Club, uh, which is $500,000 in commissions and above. I was, I was stuck there. It was a nice place to be stuck, though, at that point. And I said, well, how can I get it to the next exit? I always to hear people saying that they're making a million in real estate. Like, how do I get there? Right. So once I hired that assistant, um, the first assistant, unfortunately, did not work out. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I hired uh, 
an assistant who actually is still with us today, who actually leads one of our, our companies, um, and Josephine. And, and really, that's really where it just t- it took off. It, it changed the trajectory completely. Quite the tenure. So went from, what's that? Quite the tenure she has. Been yeah, with yeah, you yeah, since yeah. your yeah. second hire. Yeah. She would hate for me to say this, but it's almost a decade. And she, she says, I always add a year, so it's been it's nine years, <laughs> but it's almost a decade, though. Um, but yeah, once I hired that, that assistant, then I realized something, Joe. Um, I realized that I st- had to start delegating things that I didn't like to do. Not that, hold on a second. Not that I didn't like to do, things that I wasn't necessarily an expert at. Mm-hmm. Um, and then kind of fast forwarding here uh, through the journey, you know, uh, from the assistant, I hired uh, one more assistant and, a, and one other agent. And that's when my business really just skyrocketed because basically I focused on things um, that were uh, highest and, and best use of my time. And that was generating leads and opportunities. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it just, uh, it took off. So once I built a team though, after I had that one assist, one team member, I hired a couple more team members. Um, and you know, Joe, you know, the story wasn't always as, uh, how could I put this, as rosy, because basically my 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 second year I ran the team, um, you know, we talk about the smelling salt show, you know, like waking up. Absolutely. The second year I ran the team though, I, I wasn't doing it right. Mm-hmm. I wasn't doing it right. So I, so I, it's interesting. I scaled, I did everything I thought was the right way. And then I, I, I reached all, I reached a peak, right? I got these awards and boom, second year around the team, I, I basically did the diamond club, which is seven figures in revenue. Um, but I basically netted out less than six figures. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was doing it all wrong. And that's when I got the, uh, the smelling salts and saying, okay, I've got to change. Absolutely. Uh, and then I went from, from, from that, because basically what happened, Joe, I had a lot, too many operations, too many people in the operations. I wasn't focusing on the, the quote unquote, the right things. We don't have enough time here to talk about it, but not the right things. And then eventually uh, from, from that though, the final year I ran my production business, sales business. Um, yeah, I had a six figure, uh, seven figure uh, revenue and seven figure net out. So after that, this is what uh, in my mind just like exploded. I said, you know what? I can't believe it. I can't believe it. all the resources out there, whether it be YouTube, uh, top coaches, and colleagues of mine, you know, really there's no real person in a local market that's really was stepping up mm-hmm. out their agents. Absolutely. Uh, including even the top tier agents, including myself. That was the thing. I was top tier. And I said, well, who can help me? Mm-hmm. I decided at that point, I said, you know what? I'm going to open a brokerage. Mm-hmm. I said, I'm going to unpack everything. You know, I'm going to give them the Wink, wink, the real estate playbook, you know, open up the playbook and say, hey, this is how I did it. And whether you're a brand new agent, whether you're you're kind of just in the middle, you just want a little bit more, or you were that top agent all the way at the top and you want to build it to the next, next level. That's something that's been our mission here, where business helps people build their business, but also the person who's leading the, the pack over here, someone's actually did it before. Yeah. You know, a lot of times when I see these brokerages, usually the person, not usually, but sometimes the person leading the pack or persons, really they never built anything worth anything. Mm-hmm. So that's that's the challenge. Yeah. When you're, when you're, yeah. Absolutely. So, and I'm I'm a firm believer too, Mike, of everything kind of happens for a reason. And the great thing, like I'll tell my agents here, and I've heard you kind of tell yours as well. You know, it's kind of better to you know study and learn under a practitioner than a theorist, like somebody who's been there. Not necessarily just because of the knowledge that they have and the the experience, but primarily because of the mistakes, right? The mistakes you made. We've all kind of. I don't want to say we've all, but there's been several team leaders I know who've been there. They've been kind of chasing the the volume or the stage presence, the accolades, but they weren't chasing the profitability. And, you know, it it might be good for a short time or short run. And, you know, it's a great boost for the ego, but it's not going to be a healthy business that's going to be sustainable. And I think the fact that you kind of went through that, then you're able to pass that knowledge on along to your agents. And you also have been in the trenches. So, you know, kind of what it takes to get from step one to step two. And what most people don't know, if you're kind of studying a book and you've never kind of been in the trenches and you've never been the practitioner, you're more of the theorist who've just kind of done the studying or the reading is there's 10 steps in between that. And you kind of have the knowledge and experience. So you're there to pretty much guide your agents along and help them along the journey to, you know, make yourself obviously uh, one of the top brokerages in the area, but also um, ensure that your agents are going to have the success. And then hopefully they'll be able to, you know, leap over those hurdles and misses that were some things that might have. Uh, not necessarily detrimental, but, you know, might have hindered your business a little bit and stunned your growth where you didn't have that expertise at the time. Absolutely. You know, you talk, he said profitability, and that's interesting that you say that because most agents, 
okay, including myself back in the day. You know, you ask, okay, what's the net profitability of your business? What's your projected net profitability? Majority of agents don't even know. And in fact, there is, there is a book out there that talks about it. Um, and it's funny, that same book has been spread out and some companies use that book. And even agents at that company don't even know what the net profitability. And they said they read the book a bunch of times. Yeah. So I think it's a problem. I think it's a mm -hmm. problem when people don't know what their net profitability is going to be. And Joe, let's be real. I mean, it's the play, it's the playbook, but it's got to be us. The smell and salts. Yeah, there, absolutely. People say they're running a net profitability of 70%. And we both looked at each other and go, are you kidding me? Yeah. I mean, 70% net profitability of a company. I mean, how are you running your business? Mm -hmm. you have, you know, right? I mean, so it's profitability. How did it become such a dirty word in our business? Mm -hmm. you know, uh, yeah, that's great. What's your revenue? But what's your profitability? Well, it's kind of like it's, it's almost really like the, yeah, it's oh, almost like the the secret that the top kind of wants to keep hidden and and not kind of get out there for the rest of the agents. And you know, they're always promoting like the awards, the accolades, the Diamond Club, the Chairman Awards, whatever they might be, and the volume and everything's ranked by GCI or volume. But it's never really like you know what agents are in a good financial state, you know, your financial health, the vitalities of the business, and what's going to kind of ensure that you have that long-term growth and trajectory. And it's something that you could scale on rather than scaling on just pure volume and awards and stage presence. So all day, all day, every day. I completely agree. So Mike, I appreciate you kind of sharing that journey and, and providing that insight to the audience. Um, why don't you speak to us a little about, and I know obviously every market's going to be different, but um, for the viewers out there, because we've had some guests um, and all kind of coming from the Tampa market so far, and you are going to bring an interesting perspective coming kind of from New York, particularly Brooklyn, where most of your business is coming from at this time. Why don't you talk a little about what's going on? What does that look like right now? If I'm a realtor and I'm selling homes in Brooklyn or I'm a buyer seller, I'm looking to buy or sell. What's the market look like there? Yeah, so, I mean, obviously, uh, through, through the pandemic, we had, uh, you know, like, you know, we had a, we had a lockdown. In fact, our business would close down for a few months. We couldn't show any houses, pretty much sell any houses. Uh, but it's interesting. We talk about Tampa. Um, we've seen a lot of people in our Staten Island market um, and parts of Brooklyn uh, move south yeah. towards Tampa. In fact, uh, in, in some of the towns outside to, outside of Tampa. Um, but yeah, the market, thank goodness, has recovered. I would say it's in a uh, U-shaped recovery. But then now we're flatlining, and that's okay. So it went down, it came back up, but now it's flat. Mm -hmm. um, that's in Brooklyn. On Staten Island, it's 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 still growing. I mean, we are we are a thousand. Can you imagine this? A thousand listings less available this year in Staten Island than they were last year. A thousand wow. less. A thousand. So yeah, so we are you know like a lot of other states are an inventory shortage. Um, so so yeah, the market is pretty healthy. Uh, I would say multifamily, though, by us, it's different than Florida. Yeah. Uh, that one has been uh, affected a little bit because we have the eviction moratorium that's now been extended until January. So many people, investors especially, are just not, they're, they're tiptoeing into these investments unless they're getting a really, quote unquote, good deal. Uh, they're not taking them because the, there's tenants. I mean, it's crazy. Joe, I was yeah. talking to an agent in our office the other day, and uh, <laughs> he said one of the tenants asked for $90,000 to, to move out and like a cash for keys type thing on, on, on no on no on no ground just just give me 90 grand i'll move I'll say. <laughs> so, yeah so that's insane man so there's there's some challenges around multifamily but all in all i would say the market's pretty uh uh pretty healthy okay that's that's great to know yeah i was kind of wondering about that because i know you kind of hear everything in the media and i know sometimes things can be skewed but it's kind of know somebody who you know has four brokerages over 100 agents and is and the day-to-day -day grind of, of selling real estates and facilitating sales for buyers and sellers and helping them accomplish all their goals and dreams. So it's nice to really get that transparency so we can really know kind of what's going on in the marketplace. Yeah, and you know, talk about that New York. I mean, I, I'll bet on New York all day. Uh, the infrastructure is here. Uh, mm -hmm. That's one of the things that's just not gonna stop New Yorkers. I think what the media played out was people who were living in rentals, um, let's say they were coming, they were living in Tampa. They were, from, were born in Tampa. They live in Tampa. They came, they moved to New York for the, for the, for the big dream. And then, uh, you know, during, during the, uh, the, uh, COVID they, they went back home cause they could work remotely. Uh, but since I have been talking to some colleagues and friends of mine in, in Manhattan and, uh, their the rentals are just on fire. Wow. So people, it seems like people are heading back. 
Uh, again, because what the question I, I was asking people around New York when they said, no, yeah, people are leaving in mass, a mass uh, exodus. I said, yeah, but people, it's, it, the infrastructure was here and it still is. So yeah. we are completely rebounding. Um, and some of those people that actually moved uh, are already back because the, some of the companies have already called them back, especially in the banking sector. Um, so awesome, man. Yeah. Well, that's good to hear. I'm glad to hear, you know, you have a healthy, vibrant market and it sounds to be rebounding and the inventory, you know, I'm sure will slowly creep up and, you know, you have more homes sold and kind of just kind of keep the needle moving there. Oh yeah. So what would you say when it comes to Remax Edge, Mike, what would you say uh, the biggest strength of your brokerage? If I'm a buyer or a seller and I'm looking to either buy with an agent from Remax Edge or sell with an agent from Remax Edge, what's like the one main thing that you can say is the greatest attribute or strength for your company? I would say the uh, the quality of the agent, which is uh, again, which is backed up by the support of the company that absolutely uh, that agent, the support and the training. Um, through and through, we are just known. Uh, you know, we're really only taking those that are committed to growth. Uh, it sounds so cliche, but it's true. We had opportunities to probably be double in size, but there's so many agents are just not, unfortunately, just not committed to the business. Absolutely. Uh, and that's really what we have. You know, we truly have over 125 committed people. Um, so, and we have, and here's the other thing. We have 15, Joe, I can't believe this, but we are at 15 plus languages spoken in our office. Holy cow. Yeah. That's so, insane. We got two. Yeah. <laughs> <What's that? laughs> well, we got two. So I guess we're about 13 short of you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So then when it comes to so the greatest strength is quality agent, what it sounds like is you're looking for people who are true professionals to the industry. You're not literally looking for the part-timers, the hobbyists, maybe kind of coming on board just to buy a house for themselves or mom and dad. It's people who are committed, not only to the industry, but probably improving it. And then just giving that, you know, red carpet consumer experience, really, that was that concierge service to really win over all the buyers and sellers in your market. Absolutely. Okay. Fantastic. Now, when it comes to, I'm going to kind of flip the script here on you, Mike, when it comes to like your company, you know, we're going to be a little bit vulnerable here. What would you say is the one thing that you'd identify is your greatest pain point right now? What one thing are you kind of working on that you might not be struggling with, but you kind of see a minor deficiency in, and it's something that you're working on, or maybe it's been a pivot in the marketplace and something that you're trying to catch up to. What would you, what would you think that would be with Remax Edge? So because we have a lot of quality agents and, um, you know, we have, a, we have some agents that are 10 years plus in the business, five years plus in the business, brand new the business. And what's interesting about that um, is, and I think a lot of brokerages do suffer with this, is, is adoption uh, mm -hmm. of technology. Yes. And when, I, when I say that is, is that we have a lot of powerful tools that we use technology at the office and um, continuing to convince people because this is a relationship business. It's a relationship 100%. business. So, you know, agents here who have been building relationships. And it's interesting when you when you talk about agents who love to talk to people, get out there, just close deals. Uh, they're not exactly excited about sitting in front of a computer or using an app to do updates. <laughs> um, but I would say to you, though, Joe, that we we are probably ahead of the curve. We are we probably we are uh, definitely as far as an industry standard, we are probably several times more th than other companies adopting a, have an adoption of technology. I mean, there's certain pieces that we have in the office. We have about 90% adoption rate, which is way beyond. You know, some yeah. of the companies have only about you know 10, 20% of, even. of the firm. So, but that would be something I would say that's improving because I do believe, Joe, that we are, you know, we need technology, Joe. Yeah. We need autom we need automation. As much as agents want to believe that they know that they can do it all on their own without technology, you need it. You know, because one of the things, Joe, uh, is, right, I'll give you an example, like internet leads. We have a leads problem in this world, in America, right? I mean, 5 million transactions in the United States, and I believe it was a, a stat that says like 100 million leads generated. Wow. Yep, that was a recent stat. And again, don't don't quote me here right now, but I'm pretty confident that was the number I heard right. um, recently. And 100 million leads, which means we have a lead problem. Mm -hmm. Right. When we say a lead problem is, is, you know, the consumer has been trained differently than they were before. Right. When you say lead, a lead is not a lead, right? Mm -hmm. A lead is an inquiry by a human being inquiring about property. Mm -hmm. 
the economy has changed. Mm -hmm. right? and it goes back to what I was saying before about the vulnerability. You need technology to sort through that stuff. Yeah. If you don't have great systems, CRMs, or some type of retarget something, <laughs> then I'm not saying you're left behind because you still has to be relationship. Obviously, you mm -hmm. still have to have relationships, but I would love to see 100% of, of, our, of our office using technology. Although, little secret, Joe, there are some agents who are making chairman and diamond that are using very little technology. <laughs> so so I, just, I, just, I would just like to see them because I don't know what it's going to look like in 24 months. Still using the Rolodex with the legal pad? <laughs> you know, Chairman Diamond, though, you know, yeah, man. Hey, you know, hey the, I, I guarantee the profitability is high, right? <laughs> I'm a little sticky notes, you know. So, then, my kind of what I'm hearing is like, you know, one thing is, is just trying to get the agent, you know, the adoption. Sometimes, you know, what worked in the past, you know, some agents might still be having success for, but obviously, you know, we are changing, and I think it's changing at a very fast pace. And it's that adoption of technology, you know, we're in. You know, we're in immediate gratification society now, you know, with things like Amazon or eBay or all these platforms are worth the click of a button. You can kind of go and purchase and get it delivered to your house within, you know, sometime same day now. Right. So the fact is, as a human, you can only do so much. So it's like, all right, how can you leverage the tech, get the adoption from the company to use that tech to kind of meet the consumer demands, but still have that personal touch and build that relationship because it's still a belly to belly relationship. Make magic happen. All right, perfect, man. So then, Mike, if you um, if you could think back, if you know, kind of like a younger version of yourself, kind of before real estate, I know you shared a little bit about your journey. If it wasn't real estate or you know running these brokerages, what what would you see yourself doing? Uh, internationally, world renowned uh, DJ. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, <Fair enough. laughs> if, if if that didn't work, then uh, yeah, I'd probably be in it. So we pr we'd probably see you at Burning Man over there if you uh, weren't in real yeah, estate. You know, <laughs> I, ideally, ideally, yeah, something EDC, some something something like that. Uh, but no, ultimately though, if it wouldn't work out, I'd probably be uh, an attorney. Um, awesome, man. Yeah. So then, let me also ask you this too: like, if you're, you know, kind of speaking to a younger version of yourself, what do you think? You know, starting out, and and you could go with any part of this journey, whether it's you know, kind of starting that internship at the mom and pop brokerage where you kind of got, you know, your start or, you know, Remax or starting the team. What's the one main thing? You know, obviously, I know there's going to be a ton, right? There's probably more things you would have done differently than you would have repeated. Um, what do you think is the one main thing you would have done differently? I'll reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. um, I would have listened to my mentor mm -hmm. more um, earlier. And right. Then you know, hear other people's story and pivot faster from those stories. So ultimately what I would do is that I listen, listen, listen. When you, when someone tells you or gives you a warning or gives you a tip, um, don't say with a grain of salt, really do a little bit more investigative early on. Because later on in my career, Joe, um, when somebody said something to me, I had to go verify with at least three or four people. Right. And I think me and you, uh, I'll, I'll speak for myself. I just know that I verified stuff with you in the past. Like, hey, Joe, hey, here's where I'm at with this piece of technology. You know, what, what, do you, what are you guys doing over there? Mm -hmm. um, I heard that this, I, wink, wink, I heard there's some warnings that this is not going to work or, or, with the, or I heard this is going to be phenomenal. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would say that uh, my mentor, you know, had, yeah. had given me some warnings early in my career. Uh, not just warnings, but like give tips, really. Absolutely. Uh, and I wish I would have kind of... Uh, listen to them. I've been, I've been a little more open radio. I've been a little more open-minded sooner. Yeah, absolutely. And a little open-minded, not kind of had your guard up and then, you know, kind of take that information. And like you said, just listen more. And I think that's, you know, one of the things I definitely would have changed too is, you know, um, as John Chaplack, we've both been to several events. You were coached by him, but he always says like emulate before you innovate, like kind of <laughs> like try not to reinvent the wheel, do what's working first. But in addition to that, you know, we all have two ears and one mouth for a reason, right? And I think a lot of times, you know, you get a little bit of success, you want to do the talking or you think, you know, but just like you said, being a little bit open minded, vulnerable, let your guard down and really kind of absorb all that information is because, you know, there's so much value in that, that I can see myself too, speaking on myself that I neglected at a younger age, right? I didn't see the value in that. So it was like, they might've been talking to me, but I wasn't listening. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you nailed it. Yeah. So then last, Mike, um, on a closing note, just if you can, 
like if, if, if I'm a brand new agent, right? I'm newly licensed. I'm coming into the Brooklyn market. Um, what's one tip if I'm ready to sign up with, you know, uh, Remax Edge? I'm ready to hit the ground running. I'm committed. This is going to be my career. I'm dedicated. What's the one tip that you give me out the gate? The one main thing that I kind of need to instill in my beliefs to ensure that I'm going to have as much success as I possibly can. That's a, that's a, that's a tough one, but I would say that, um, you know, this is hard work. And I mm -hmm. think that the challenge with our industry, Joe, is that uh, it comes off and people dance around that. Leaders dance around. They tell you right away, you join the company tomorrow, boop, checks are just going to be showering you. Um, what I have found is when you kind of tell people like it is, um, you know, the drop-offs might be more, but the, the people that stay longer uh, outweigh the drop-offs at some point because, um, you know, they already, the expectation. And I think that was reading a survey that Nara said that most people that got out of the business is because they, their expectations were not met. They mm -hmm. didn't have the right expectations of being a, a realtor. Nice. So I would say that, uh, uh, of course, as we said, open-mindedness is always the key, but uh, getting that expectation, making sure that you the, the expectations are correct and, and work hard. Yeah, and absolutely. It sounds vague. Joe, yeah. it sounds vague, man, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's a five, six day a week business, uh, you know, uh, I wouldn't say 24 seven because it's not uh, it's not 24 seven, but commit, commit to growth and commit to excellence. Absolutely. So you're saying that if they're coming with the expectation that it's going to be what they see on TV with million dollar listing, it might not end up being that way. Is that what you're saying, Mike? <laughs> yeah, because that's the, cause you see, because that type of stuff sells, right? Right. Uh, the challenge is imagine, you know, not imagine just a brand new person coming in off the streets who their expectation was to come in, I work a few hours and I make these big checks. That's not how it really is. No. And we all no. know, and we all, we all know that. Uh, the challenge is that uh, do we, do we tell that to the agent when they come in or do we fear that they would not join us if we told them like, Hey, this is going to be hard. Yeah, so absolutely. That's what I would tell a brand new agent because, uh, you, and I've done it before. I've done it. And uh, some agents, they, they don't join. And uh, they actually, some, some agents actually don't even join another company. After. Uh, but then others have really said, okay, I'm ready for this. And uh, their business source. Yeah. And it sounds like your beliefs and it's no surprise are perfectly aligned with kind of ours here with, uh, you know, me and Rose running this brokerage uh, 54 Realty, where I saw the agents kind of coming in, you know, I go, there's going to be three main attributes that you need to kind of be successful here. And if you have these, possess these three or can stay committed to them, then I ensure you'll have success. Two of them you, you talked on, which was hard work. The other one was open-minded, you know, always be open-minded, new ideas. And the third one is just be coachable and trainable, right? Which I think you kind of alluded to as well and combined them. And I said, as long as you have those three, don't worry about the tech. We can teach the tech. We have the systems. We can get the leads. We can find the business. But if you're, I always tell them if any one of those three virtues is compromised, it's just not going to work. So you're not, it's not going to be a good fit for you. And it sounds like that's kind of your belief as well. Boom. <laughs> Well, on that note, Mike. Uh, <laughs> burr, 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 burr. So, uh, on that note, Mike, um, you know, we greatly appreciate having you, man. I know as you're very busy. I appreciate you kind of dedicating the time for the real estate podcast or the real estate playbook, um, being a part of the podcast, kind of sharing your story for the audience. And I greatly appreciate you, man. And uh, I'm glad we could get you on. Thanks, man. Thanks for the opportunity. All right. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Take care.